Welcome to the Zika Public Sector Financial Management presentation or PFM4 paper. To start with, I'm going to take you through the uh, general competencies that are expected after the completion of the course. So as a, a, a qualified person who has completed this course, you need to have known what, what public finance is and also you need to have a demonstration of the knowledge of um, budgets, how you know, the budget process, government budget, how it is prepared, and so on. And then you also need to know the, um, how government sources funds, how government sources funds and how those funds are used. The other thing that is very, very key as a, I mean, the main competence is uh, how to prepare investment appraisal of a project. How do you undertake investment appraisal of a project? That is very, very key in this course. And then, of course, an outline of various financial management activities. So these are the competences that are expect to, expected of, of you after you've completed the program. Now let's look at the common errors, the common mistakes that are exhibited by candidates when attempting uh, investment appraisal questions. So what are those uh, common errors? First of all, we'll look at uh, annuities. So what is an annuity? An annuity is a constant stream of equal cash flows expected over a fixed period. For instance, if a, a, a project is expected to generate a cash flow of 10,000 kwacha per annum for five years, that 10,000 kwacha is an annuity. And so how, how do you apply a discount factor to an annuity? So the discount factor that is used is the cumulative discount factor for that number of years that the cash flow is expected to occur. So if the, uh, like in the example I've given, if it's a five year annuity, then you use the cumulative discount factor for five years. And that can be found in the discount factor table at the, the back of your exam paper, you find the present value tables, they are provided for you. So don't go to the, to, the, um, to the other table, go to the annuity table, because there are two, two tables, the present value table and the annuity table. So go to the annuity table and pick out the annuity factor for five years at that given cost of capital. So you'll be given a cost of capital to use, to discount the cash flow. So what is the cost of capital? It's simply the expected return that the, 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 the company expects to, to generate on its investment. That's the cost of capital. It's the cost of funds, which is equal to the expected return. So this cost of capital, you don't have to worry. It will be provided for you in the exam. So you use it to discount. So what does it mean to discount? You, you simply multiply the, um, the, the decimal figure that, that, that is given to you as the cost of capital by the, the 10,000, which is the annuity. So you multiply the annuity factor by the cash flow. In, that means you arrive at the, the present value of the annuity. So that is very, very key. And uh, a number of candidates are confused uh, with uh, annuities. So once you catch that, then you have no problems with annuities. And then the other uh, common mistake is the failure to compute the payback period. F 
failure to compute the payback period correctly. So what is the payback period? The payback period is simply the time taken to recoup the initial investment cost. If for instance a project cost 100 is expected to cost you know, 100,000, how long will it take to recoup or to recover that 100,000? How many years or months will it take for the business to recover that money which it initially invested? So that is the payback period. So how is it computed? You simply subtract the cash inflows from the initial investments cost beginning from year one up to the time that the initial investment is fully exhausted. So for instance, if year one, the initial investment is 100,000 and the cash inflows are 10,000 kwacha per annum, it means the payback period will be 10 years because you just divide the 100,000 by 10,000. That will give you a payback period of 10 years. However, sometimes you find that the cash inflows might not be you know, equal. Maybe in the first year, you, the, the, business, the, the project is expected to generate 10,000. In the second year, 20,000. In the third year, 30,000. So that's where now it, it becomes a challenge for some candidates. So when the situation is like that, you need to subtract year by year. You don't divide like where I said 100,000 by 10,000. This time you have to subtract 100,000 minus 10,000 for the first year, then minus 20,000 for the second year, then that you remain with 70,000. Then maybe in the fourth year, if the cash inflow is 50,000, you subtract the 50,000 from the 70, you remain with 20,000 and so on. So that, that's how you'll be able to arrive at the payback period as you subtract bit by bit. And then you remain with a balance. So that balance that you remain, for instance, 20,000 as you are subtracting, if that balance that you remained with is smaller than the, 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 the cash inflows, then you divide that balance by the cash inflow to arrive at the, the fraction now, say it will be five years, maybe 5.2 years or 5.3 years and so on. So that is how the payback period is computed. Then the other error, a common error is the mixing up accounting rate of return formulas. Some candidates, they just have one formula for accounting rate of return. But remember, the account rate of return is a profitability measure, and profitability measures are subjective. So they, it has several ways of arriving at it. Okay, so the, um, the first formula and the most common one is where you divide the, the profits, the accounting profits after depreciation by the average investment. So accounting profits after depreciation by the average investment times 100. So the accounting profits after depreciation means after, if say you have profits, those profits must, you must have subtracted depreciation for them to be called accounting profits after depreciation. So sometimes examiners might give you profits before depreciation. That's, so they, are, they want to, to test your understanding to see whether you know that the, 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 the numerator should be accounting profits after depreciation. That, that is the numerator of the formula. So you must always be mindful of that. And then the, 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 the denominator, which is the average investment, is calculated as the original investment plus the disposal value or the scrap value divided by two. The original investment plus the scrap value divided by two. 
That is how you arrive at the average investment. So say for instance, the, 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 the project is ex the, the expect the, the project expect to generate maybe 20,000 per annum for five years as the profits, accounting profits. The average profits will be 20 will be 20,000 times five, which is 100,000. Divide by five, which will give you 20,000. But in reality, you find the profits might not be equal. So maybe first year, the profits will be 10,000, next year 30, the other year 40, and so on. So when you add those profits, you divide by the number of years of the project, meaning the number of years that the project is expected to, to last. You divide it, those years, you divide them into the into the total profit. So you add up the profits, and you divide by the number of years that the project is expected to last. That is the average profit. Then you divide that by the average investment, which is the original investment, meaning the cost of the project, because the project has a cost. Okay, so the cost of the project, you add the scrap value, because at the end of the project, it, it is expected to, to be disposed of at a certain you know, scrap value amount. So you add that to the original investment and you divide by two. You say the original investment is 200,000, scrap value 10,000, means it will be 210,000, that is original investment plus the scrap value, then divide that by two, so that will be 105,000 as your average, investment. So that is the accounting rate of return based on average investment. Sometimes the, exam, the examiner might say calculate the accounting rate of return based on initial investment. In which case you can use the formula um, accounting which is the average accounting annual accounting profits divided by the initial investment. Because the question has specified to say using the initial investment. So it will be average annual accounting profit divided by the initial investment. So you don't need to add the scrap value this time. You, if the initial investment was 200, you simply divide the average annual accounting profits by 200,000. And then the other one, uh, the other formula. It's also based on initial investment, in which case you can calculate the average, the total profits by the initial investment. The total profits, meaning in this case, all the profits without dividing by the number of years, by the initial investment. So those are the formulas that um, are used in accounting rate of return. And also sometimes the examiner might say return on capital employed. So don't be confused. It's the same. The, the, the accounting rate of return is also called the return on capital employed. So don't be confused to say maybe the examiner is asking for something new. It is the same thing. That, and don't forget to multiply by 100 because the accounting rate of return is, is in percentage. Don't forget to multiply the answer by 100 because the accounting rate of return is in percentage. And, and if they say return on capital employed, just know it's the same thing that they are looking for. Okay, so that is that on the, the accounting rate of return. And then also we have the, um, the, the payback period accounting rate of return, which I've already, you know, alluded to. Also, sometimes they might say return on investment. So it's the same thing. When they say return on investment, they are still talking about the same measure. You see why sometimes students might, you know, get confused. So don't be a victim. If they say return on investment, they say accounting rate of return, they say uh, re uh, return on capital employed, they are still talking about the same issue. Okay. Then the other error, common mistake, is failure to follow instructions. Failure to follow instructions. Sometimes, especially in compulsory questions, the PFM for paper, 
might have a report, might require a report from a student or from the candidate. So when they ask you to prepare a report, remember the format of the report because the report carries some marks, maybe two marks, maybe three marks. So do not lose three marks you know, because the report is standard. You don't need to study and so on. You just, it's just the format. So some candidates have ignored the report. You know, they, they know the information, they have the, the knowledge, but they did not use the report form format as required by the exam and therefore they lost four marks and those are the marks that they needed to cross to 50 because remember the pass mark is 50 so every mark is crucial so remember when they say report format they must be the author okay where the report is coming from where is the report coming from and then where is it going who are the intended recipients and then there must be an introductory paragraph a report must have an introductory paragraph say if you say you are asked to prepare a report you know on the outcome of um, an uh, of uh, a project you can put a heading to say report on outcome of project abc and then you put an introductory paragraph where you say, you know, I, you know, I, the, the following report is based on, on the project we just ended and so on. Okay, so there should be some kind of what? Introduction. And then the main body, now you explain exactly the, the income generated in the report, the profits and so on, and the challenges, and then the conclusion. So a report has got a format and those are the things that can allow you as a candidate to score good marks so to make up for your um, shortcoming maybe if you have a shortcoming but uh, at least you follow the instructions you have your if it's three marks for the report you get your three marks three marks you know, i call them three marks because it is standard okay so remember to follow instructions then the other item that we'll look at uh, uh, is also the, the, the common errors exhibited by candidates when attempting theory questions. Remember, the first one was uh, common errors uh, exhibited when attempting investment appraisal questions. Now we'll look at the common errors exhibited by candidates when attempting theory questions. So what are those common errors? The most common one is uh, failure to refer to the scenario. Okay, because some of the questions are scenario based. So if a question is scenario based, it means we don't just have to, to reproduce what you studied in the manual. No, you've got to apply the knowledge that you got to the scenario, to the real life scenario, in, you know, to the real life situation in the scenario. So you apply the knowledge to that question. Instead of just uh, reproducing the information from the textbook, you can uh, refer always to the question as you are writing the answer, as you, as you respond, you keep on referring to the question. Then, that, then it means you are what? You are applying your knowledge to that particular question rather than just reproducing the information. It's a sign that uh, you are, you are not referring to the scenario. Okay, so it's important to apply your knowledge you know, and, you know, and understand the subject because the, the examiner wants to know whether you just memorized or you actually understand the subject. If you just memorized, definitely you just reproduce the information. You don't understand it. So scenario-based questions are very important because they test your understanding of the knowledge and whether you can apply that knowledge to a real life situation. Because remember, you are a professional, you are being trained to be a professional. And you will be working in a real life environment where you, you face real life challenges. So you need to apply the knowledge to real life challenges. 
So the other error under theory is the failure to follow instructions given in the question. So each question is unique, you know, each question is unique, so you should take it as it comes. For instance, if they ask you to prepare a table, just prepare the table. Because if you don't, you will lose marks for that. Or they ask you to write it, you know, briefly. Just write briefly, you know. So make sure that you scan through. Scan through the question before you start. Read through the question so that you have a clear picture of what the examiner is asking for as you answer the question. Because if you just start writing, just because you know the first sentence, you might, you might lose out because there are some instructions which might come at the end of the question. So read through the question before you start answering. Read through once or twice. Read through the question once or twice so that you are clear about the instructions. Sometimes the question might ask you for advantages. Now, because you have studied too much, you prepare, you know, you present everything, advantages and disadvantages. Sometimes that, that doesn't gain you marks, you lose, your, you lose time and you, you confuse even the, the marker. Because you're wondering, is this an advantage? You know? So just follow the instructions that is presented in the question. So very, very important, follow instructions. Then the other item is the examination answering techniques. So what are the techniques that we can follow? So the first one is handwriting. Now you might be, if you have a good handwriting, you maybe love to say handwriting. But believe me, some handwriting are simply, you know, unreadable. And that gives a challenge to the person who is marking. Because you find that he has to strain his eyes and maybe the person is tired. Yeah, he has got a heap of uh, scripts that he's been marking. And then he comes to your script. And the handwriting is just, you know, the doctor's handwriting, if you know what I mean. So please ensure that your handwriting is something that can be read. You know, easily read. Not with what? With strain. Because that, that means you might, the, the person who is marking might not see some of your points. And you might end up being disadvantaged. You might lose some marks. Because some of the points that you are bringing out, he, he or she is not able to see those points. Okay? So work on your handwriting. That is if your, your handwriting is not good. So another technique is spotting question. There are those who like spotting question, meaning they say if last year investment appraisal was not in the exam, definitely this year there will be an investment appraisal question. So last year maybe budgeting was not examined, so this year definitely budgeting is coming. So such student, students are at risk because the exam is intended to cover everything, the whole syllabus. So if you are that type who likes you know, predicting, then you, you, are, you are at a risk. You are at a risk of um, making a big mistake because you, you might find yourself that the same topic which was examined last sitting is examined again because the examiner doesn't look at him the topic, the content, not really, the topic can be examined, but the content might be different. The topic can be examined twice, but the, what matters is the content. So if you just look at, no, this topic was examined, so I will not look at it. Then it means you are at a risk of failing, because the same topic can be examined in five different ways. And the intention, you know, Zika intention is to ensure that oh, the whole syllabus is covered. That the student is fully baked. So if you want to specialize, 
when you are at you know you are running a, a risk of failing you know you are at a risk of failing because you have to know each and every part of the syllabus so that see, you are you know fully um, equipped fully equipped for the work environment and the other um, technique which uh, is important is question selection how do you select questions some candidates start with the most difficult question. This makes them waste a lot of time. If you start with the most difficult question, you waste a lot of time. And then you end up panicking at the end, so, so that even those simple questions you fail now to, 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 to answer them correctly because you are, you are actually what? Panicking. Because you have spent so much time, and have, uh, you know, some they will spend so much time on the compulsory question. They will spend the whole maybe two hours on the compulsory question. Such so that when they go to, to section B, they don't have enough time. And that creates a problem for them to pass because you cannot pass an exam just from a compulsory question. So it is very important that you start with the easiest question. Start with the easiest question, the question which is easy for you. It might not be easy for the next person, but it might be easy for you. So start with the one which you think you can do justice and do justice quickly and go to the next so that you have more time now for those difficult areas and you end up with a good result. So it's the same thing I mentioned to say read through the what? The exam. So that's also very important. Read through because you cannot tell whether it is simple or difficult if you have not read through. So read through thoroughly so that you know which one is easy for you, which one is difficult for you. Okay, so that is what? Question selection. The other one is failing to allocate time for each question. Failing to allocate time for each question. If a question is 30 marks, you, you, you need to, for instance, a, an exam is 100 marks, isn't it? So 100 marks, 100 marks takes you three hours for PFM, for exam, and many other exams. So 100 marks, so the three hours is 180 minutes. 180 minutes, because there are 60 minutes in an hour, times three hours, which is 180 minutes. So 180 minutes divided by 100 marks is 1.8 minutes per mark. So that gives you an idea of how many minutes you should spend per the question. So if a question is 30 marks, you just multiply 30 marks by 1.8 minutes. That gives you an idea of the maximum, not the minimum, but the maximum number of minutes that you should spend on a question, okay? You should not exceed that maximum because if you exceed, it means you are stealing time from the other questions. So it's very important that you, you allocate time for each question correctly. And the other technique is the meaning of some syllabus command words, okay? So each question has got you. Um, there are there are words which are used. You know, there are words which are used. Sometimes they will say define, describe, explain, examine, illustrate. So you need to know the meaning of each. You know, each of those what command words. For instance, to define is to give the meaning. Simply give the meaning. Don't start discussing when they have asked you to what. Define. Just define and that's it. And to describe is to give more detail now. Okay? Give more detail. To explain is to give reasons for something. Okay? You give reasons why something, you know, for why a particular event, why something is done the way it is done, or why it has happened like that, and so on. To examine is to take apart and describe the concept in greater detail. Okay, so examining requires more detail. 
illustrate, when you are asked to illustrate, give examples. Maybe in diagram, give a simple example. That is what? Illustrating. Take your career prospects to the next level with Zika. Our diploma in accountancy is an essential qualification if you're planning on entering the accounting profession. The Zika tax program at both certificate and diploma level equips you with an enhanced understanding of the field of taxation. Our diploma in public sector financial management is ideal for accountants or trainee accountants working in the public sector. And CA Zambia, a respected designation designed to ensure that graduates are highly trained to hold senior positions in the workplace. You can study through flexible options like self-study as well as part-time or full-time through our accredited tuition providers. Zika sponsors the top CA Zambia graduate to the One Young World Summit for Young Leaders and also offers scholarships to the top university accountancy graduates from recognized universities. Visit zika.co.zm now for more information or find us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Don't delay. Your future awaits. Then sometimes they will simply ask you to list. Don't write a paragraph. List. Okay? List. If they say list, then you list. Number one is this. Number two is number three. So that is following what? Instructions. Interpret. If they say interpret, it means you need to explain and give a comment. You give your opinion. Explain and comment. Explain and comment. Then if they say state, if the question is saying is state, just give the main point. Just give the main point. You don't need to, to explain a lot. But you are just stating. Then to summarize, if they say summarize, it's similar to stating. Okay? Very, very similar also to stating. Okay, so we have covered the common mistakes. Um that are made by candidates in investment appraisal questions. And also we've covered the, the errors of common mistakes in theory questions. We've also looked at what? The examination techniques. Okay, so those are very, very now. <clears throat> there are also um, other, other errors <clears throat> that uh, Candidates you know, are exposed to. You focus too much on one, you know, you, when you are studying, do not focus too much on one topic. Okay, do not study one topic too much. The reason being that the, the, you are required to know every area of the syllabus. Okay, you are required to know every area. So do not just be focused on one area only okay you must be broad it's important to be broad because what if for that particular city what if the examination is slightly different and they they decide to examine the topics which are least examined then you'll be one of the victims so to avoid being one of the victims you must read all the topics all the topics in the syllabus okay avoid over emphasizing or concentrating on the topic that you love okay so i have an, an a scenario here a practical scenario examination question this is a company that is considering investing in a plant okay this company is considering investing in a plant to manufacture steel over a four-year period okay so this is the project okay this is what the project so the project there are, there are two projects that is considering so it's considering investing in steel so it is looking at which which one is it has two projects available so it's because it wants to see now which project it should invest in which is the best project amongst the two so there are two projects, project A and project B. So this is a typical investment appraisal question. Because investment appraisal looks at the future. It looks at the future and the, the decision that will be made. Okay? 
which decision should we make before we commit ourselves, we commit our finances. So that is what? Investment appraisal looks at. Which project should we invest in? Because remember, investment appraisal you know, uh, is based on capital projects. Capital projects are long-term projects and they involve huge amounts of money. So since they involve huge amounts of money and they are long-term projects, they need to be appraised. Before investing, you need to do what? To appraise them. Okay, so that's why they are always looking at you, the future to say company XYZ is considering, company you know, ABC is considering, and so on. So that we do not make a mistake. Why? Because the, the, the project requires a huge amount of money, which we are not ready to lose, and is very time consuming. And the projects also are irreversible. Almost. Imagine you set up a factory and it was a mistake. You set up, you, you constructed a building, it was a mistake. Because those are the capital projects. Buildings, factories, machinery, you know. So that's why we need to appraise. So in this particular scenario question, we have DF Limited. It's a government-owned company. Remember, PFM4 is public sector. So even the questions you know, are public sector related questions. So DF, DF Limited is a government-owned company and is considering investing in a plant. Okay? So there are two possible what? projects, Project A and Project B. So these projects will be funded by government okay, using internal sources. Okay? So let's now look at the question. Before I finish the reading out, let's look at the question. The question is, appraise each of the projects using the following method. Appraise each of the projects using the following methods. Number one, the net present value. Number two, the internal rate of return. Number three, the payback period. Okay, so the net present value. Is it, what is the net present value? It's the present value of cash inflows minus present value of cash outflows. Okay, that's the net present value. So it means you are required to discount the cash flows from those two projects, project A and B. You discount the cash flows expected at the required cost of capital. Now, the cost of capital is provided in the question, like in this particular one, the cost of capital was 10%. Okay, so you go to the back of your question paper, you find the discount table. Remember, this time it's not an annuity for project, for project A. It is not an annuity. So you go to the back of your paper, you look for 10% discount factor, and then you apply the discount factor to each cash flow over the five year period and you multiply that discount factor which is basically a decimal maybe 0 0.1 0 0.2 you multiply it by each of the cash flows that are provided in the question that means you are discounting the cash flows so why do we discount the cash flows the reason why we discount the cash flows is because the, the we are we are looking at a future project a future investment so the cash flows in future, their value is expected to be less than the current cash flow. So the current cash flows are called present value cash flow. So we discount those future cash flows to arrive at today's equivalent or the present value. So that is why we discount the what? Those cash flows to arrive at what? Today's value because the cash flows are expected to occur maybe in two years, in year three, year four, year five, until the end of the project. So, in, but the decision is being made today. So we've got to discount them so that we have the values, the equivalent values in today's what? You know, today's um, currency or, or equivalent today's what? Quarters or dollars and so on. So that is why 
we discount the cash flows is to equate them to the present value cash flows. So in this case, all you need, you need to do is to, um, to multiply those discount factors by the cash flows. So for instance, in the first year, for project A, the discount factor is 0 0.909. You multiply that by the cash flow for year one. And then in year two, is 0 0.826, a discount factor 10%. Multiply that by the cash flow for year two. So when you look at the cash flows, you find that each cash flow for year one, it was 52. Year two, 73. So you multiply the 52 by the discount factor for year one, and so on. Then the 73 by the discount factor at 10% for year two. 61 multiplied by the discount factor, 10% for year three. Now, that is to arrive at what the present value of the cash flows, meaning the profits or the cash profits. So when you get the answer, the answer you find you must now subtract from the cost of the investment or the cost of the factory or the project. The answer you find if it's negative, then it means that project is not worthwhile. So you find in the question they will ask you like in this particular one to advise which project should be undertaken. Okay, they will ask you advise which project should be undertaken. So you, so what you say is, um, you say that project, the project with the higher MPV should be what? Undertaken. The project with the higher MPV, or that is if both of them are, are, are going to give a positive net present value. But if one of them will give you a negative, then it's the project with the positive net present value. Because if the net present value is positive, it means that the returns from the project cash flows are higher than the cost of capital. That's the meaning if the NPV is what? Positive. It means the returns from the cash flows of the project are higher than the cost, the cost of capital or the cost of funds. So the cost of capital is the cost of funds. So we compare the returns that will be generated with the what? The cost of the funds that will be acquired to, to, um, to invest in that project. Okay, so that is, that's what you, that's what you say. So in most investment appraisal questions, you'll be required to advise. So do not forget to advise. Do not forget to advise. So in this case, this question at project A, and project B. So you are required to advise to say this the project that should be invested in is project, you know, like in this case it was project B. And the reasons are that it has a higher NPV than project A. Okay, so that is NPV. Now what about the internal rate of return? Because in part B, the question is asking to calculate the internal rate of return. What is internal rate of return? The internal rate of return is that discount rate which when used, it will give us a zero NPV. That's the internal rate of return. So if we use that discount uh, rate or cost of capital to discount the cash flow, we should arrive at a zero NPV. That is what internal rate of return is. And the formula is provided. You know, formula is provided. If it's not provided, make sure that you, you have it. Make sure that you, you, you memorize it. Okay? So that is also another challenge where you find some students are not able, they do not know the formula for internal rate of return. So to arrive at internal rate of return, you must have two NPVs. Okay, so the, the, you calculate the NPV with the cash flows that are provided to you in the question and using the cost of capital provided to you in the question. If that NPV is positive, then 
calculate another NPV using a higher cost of capital. So if the first cost of capital, like in this question, is 10%, and you find a positive NPV, then calculate another um, NPV using a higher cost of capital. Okay? Using a higher cost of capital. Say 15%, like in this scenario. Okay? Then if the, so the second NPV should, should be negative. If it's not negative, use the higher cost of capital. So at the end of the day, we should end up with two NPV, a positive and a negative. A positive and a negative. So the, the IRR formula requires you to use what? Two NPVs. There are two NPVs in the formula. And two discount rates or cost of capital. A lower one and a higher one. Two NPVs, a lower one and a higher one. So that is how so you, you input those um, figures in the, in the formula. You arrive at the internal rate of return. Okay, as you can see, this is the formula for internal rate of return. Okay. Now, what is the interpretation? What is the interpretation of in general rate of return? So it's the, it's the highest cost of capital at which a project can be accepted. I said initially, I said it is the, I said it, it is the, that, that discount rate, which when you use it to discount the cash flows, you arrive at a zero NPV. But we can also say it is the highest cost of capital at which a project can still be viable. And that means when you are interpre interpreting the IRR, the project with the highest IRR is the one which should be accepted. Why? Because it means that project is still viable even at a higher cost. Because remember, the cost of capital is the cost of funds. So it means if a project has a high RR, it means it is still viable even at a high cost. Remember, the cost of capital is the, is the cost of equity, the cost of debt. Equity, that is what? Shares, isn't it? Ordinary shares. Debt, that is what? Borrowings and so on. So the, the cost of capital is used to discount the cash flows. And if we find the NPV is positive, it means that the cash flows that have been generated are higher than the cost of obtaining the funds for investment. So if the IRR is positive, it means that, um, or rather if the IRR is high, it means that the project can still be accepted at a high you know, uh, cost to the company, meaning the project is very viable such that even if the cost of obtaining the funds is high, we'll still make a profit. Okay, so the interpretation, therefore, when you when you are asked now to make a recommendation, because most questions will ask you to recommend to management, the project with the highest IRR is the one which should be accepted. Okay, so in this case, like this case we had project B, it had a higher internal rate of return than project A. So that's the project we should be accepted. And then the payback, the other question was on what? The payback period for the same project, project A. So the payback period, as I explained, in this case, the, the cash flows, the, the initial investment was 240. And in year one, the cash inflows of the project was 52. So therefore, you when you subtract the 240, the 52 from the 240, you arrive at 188. Meaning in the first year, the, the, the project is expected to recoup or recover 52. Out of the 240 initial investment, the project is expected to recover 52. Okay? Out of the 240 quarter investment. And that will leave it with what? 188. Then the cash flows from project A in the second year is what? 73. So out of that 188 which is remaining to be recouped, 73 has been recouped. Okay? Therefore, what will remain is what? 115 out of that 
188. Then in the third year, the cash flows are 61. And what is expected to remain unrecouped is only 54 out of that 115 because the cash flow of 61 has been generated. Therefore, now the payback period will be in year four because in year four, the cash inflows that are expected from this project are less than the amount that is required to be recouped. Okay? Amount, they are, in fact, they are more, which is 59, than the cash inflows that, that are required to be recouped. It means all the cash flows will be recouped in year four because we expect to generate 59 out of the 54 remaining. So therefore, the payback period will be in the, in the fourth year. So it will be three years plus 54 over 59, which is 3.915 years. That is a, a payback period. Now, what is the interpretation? Again, you are asked what? Recommend to management. You compare project A and project B. Which project should be selected? So the answer is what? Project B. Why? Because it has a lower payback. So what is the significance of payback? Payback, the significance is that you want to get back your money quickly. The money that you put into a project, the money you invested, you want to recover it as quickly as possible. So therefore, when making recommendations, it is that project which has the shortest payback which should be selected. If the question asks you to make a recommendation between project A and B, like in this case, project A had a payback of 3.9 years, project B's payback is 2.5 years. So it means the project with a shorter payback should be selected. Why? Because it is less risky. Why is it less risky? Because the, the, the initial investment is expected to be recouped or realized in a shorter period, only 2.5 years, compared to, to project A, which is expected to recoup or recover the initial investment in a longer period. So remember, the longer the years, the more risky because those funds that you've invested in, in anything can happen. There is that uncertainty, isn't it? So, if the if the if it will take time to recover the cash flows, it means there is more risk in that project. Unlike the the project where the cash flows will be easily recovered. Okay, so that is the payback period. So that, that, that those are the. The, the basis of what? Recommending. Okay. Then the, the other issue I'd like to highlight in this question is on project, um, project B. If you look at project B, the cash flows are equal. Okay. The cash flows are expected to be equal. In year 2, we expect 80. In year 3, 80. In year 4, 80. In year 5, 80. Remember we discussed this, we said this is an annuity where the cash flows are equal and constant over a period. That is known as an annuity. And so we use an annuity factor of 10% from year 2 to year 5 to, to arrive at a one a discount factor or a cumulative discount factor. So you look at the back of the table. The second table is usually the annuity factor table. At the back of your paper, you get your 10%. Okay, now, in this case, if you look at year one, there are no cash flows for the project. B. It's zero. So it, it creates a challenge. So that means you need for you to you need a discount factor, a cumulative discount factor from year two to year five. So meaning you go to the way you get it. Because the tables, they will give you a cumulative discount factor from year 1 to 3, year 1 to 4, year 1. They start from year 1. But for us to isolate a discount factor from the middle of, you know, maybe from the second year or the third year, it, 
it will require us to subtract those years before. So in this case, we need to subtract the discount factor for year one from the cumulative discount factor of what? Year one to five. That will give us the cumulative discount factor of year two to year two to five. Okay? And that is what we use to discount the what? The, um, the cash, for, cash flows for project B. That's what we use to discount the cash flows for project B. It is the cumulative discount factor. So in this case, the cumulative discount factor that should be used is 2.482 because the, the annuity factor 10% for 5 years was 3.71, 3.791. Okay, then we subtract the annuity factor for year 1 so that we end up with the annuity factor for year 2 to 5. And that's what we use to multiply by the 8, 8 million to arrive at the present value factor, which is 230. Then to arrive at the NPV, we subtract the initial investment cost, which was 200 million from the, the present value, okay, which is 230 to arrive at an NPV of 30. So that is how the... Um, the annuity factor can be applied now practically. Okay. Right, so that is an example. And another, the, the, the part B of the question, part B of the question also, there was some theory now. Okay, advise the management of DF limited which project they should select which is what we have done so you need to write okay write if you don't write there are no marks write to say we should select project b and you give the reasons because it has a higher np because it has a lower payback than project a isn't it so because we are saying project b select project b because it has a higher npv than project a because it has a shorter payback than project A, isn't it? And then, because it uh, has a, um, a higher IRR, which is higher internal rate of return than project A. So part B is saying, advise the management of DF Limited, which project they should select for investment. Then part C, explain how government could revise its fiscal monetary policy in order to finance a project. Remember the question was saying, the, the, the companies, the, 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 they are looking for money, isn't it? They are looking for money to invest. So the government is looking for money to invest. So how can that project be financed? Using what? Monetary or? Or you know, fiscal policy. So he's saying, explain how government could revise its fiscal monetary policy in order to finance the what? The project. So what is the uh, fiscal policy? So fiscal policy is how government, how they control, you know, the, the, the flow of money, isn't it? Using it, taxation. How does government control the flow of money using the budget spending and taxation? Okay, they can increase tax rates. So if the government increases the tax rates in the budget, they want to raise more money. So in this case, this is where, where we discussed to say apply. You need to apply the knowledge to the question. So in this case, you can say government could revise its fiscal policy, they could raise taxes. They could raise taxes in order to raise money to invest in this particular project. They could raise money by what? Raising what? Taxes. Okay. And the other one, we said, the, the question is saying monetary policy. So monetary policy is, is now looking at interest rates. Okay. The government could increase you know, its interest rates to attract what? Investors. Because when interest rates on bonds are increased, here we are looking at the bonds Treasury bills and so on. When they are increased, everyone wants to buy bonds, wants to buy the treasury. 
So when you buy the bond, you are effectively you are you are releasing money to government because you buy them from Bank of Zambia. So that is what government finance. So when they buy those bonds, means they've given you money. They've given the government money to invest in that project. So explain how government could revise its fiscal or monetary policy. They could uh, raise taxes or uh, monetary policy. They could raise the interest rates to attract uh, um, investors. Yes. Okay. And then explain the advantages and disadvantages that part D of a budget deficit. So when you receive such a question, explain advantages and disadvantages. First, you explain what a budget deficit is. Similar to part C, first you explain what is fiscal policy. Okay? To show that you understand. Yes. Don't just go to, a, to, a, to talk about fiscal policy. First explain what is fiscal policy, what is monetary policy. So in this case, explain what's a budget deficit. So explain, you say it's you know, a, a budget deficit is where the budget the, the, has got higher on the government budgets, higher expenditure compared to revenue. And then there is a shortage. Remember, the revenue comes from taxes, then expenditure goes to various, you know, yeah, various um, items of expenditure in the budget. So if the government plans to spend more than it will raise in taxes, it means it's running a budget deficit. So the shortfall is the deficit. And it's, you, you normally obtain from borrowing to make up the shortfall, borrowing and grants and other and cooperating partners. So it means you what? Already explained that's maybe two months because you know what a budget deficit is. Then what are the advantages? Oh, you start. The advantages of a deficit is that um, it will release more money into the economy because it means government is spending. If they are spending, it means they, will, you know, they are creating employment. So that's an advantage. Okay. Remember, this part is also coming from the question. If you look at the question, it's talking about a budget deficit. So this part, part D, is linked to the question. It is scenario-based. So you still you explain to say the advantage of a deficit is that more money will be released, jobs will be created. If roads are constructed, let's say infrastructure development, that is employment creation and also creating an enabling environment for foreign investment. Because when infrastructure is, you know, is good, means you are attracting what? Foreign investment. So you explain, you give reasons why you feel that a budget deficit is good. Then also, what are the drawbacks? You explain the drawbacks. Because the more you borrow, remember it is financed through borrowing. So the more you borrow, the more you tie yourself to, to some covenants. Because certain, some loans come with covenants, agreements, which might not be good for the you know, for the economy so you tie yourself to um, borrowing and you are owing for a long time and you fail now it's like the economy is affected so you explain what are the disadvantages of a deficit in your own ways you know in your own way okay so basically that is um, that is that scenario Another practical question, then discuss the risks. Okay, discuss the risks that HF Limited is currently facing. So this one, first of all, they give you a scenario of a government-owned manufacturing company, okay, which commenced operations three years ago, and it is mainly engaged in steel manufacturing. The, the government is facing various economic challenges. So they give you a scenario. Then from that scenario now, they are asking you questions. So what are the risks? So part A, they are saying, discuss the risks that HF Limited is currently facing. So, so the risk, you get them from a scenario. So what is the scenario saying? It's saying that 
um, the, the, gov the government is facing various economic challenges in the provision of public goods and services and the formation of the companies in fulfillment of the policy of nationalization and also creating employment in the, in the country. Okay. The government was recently formed after a heavily contested general election. So you see, so you can pick out the risks from there. So general election, that brings in what? Political risk, isn't it? It means that one of the risks might be maybe political. Okay? And then there are also other types of risks. Physical risks, economic risks, because the government, the, 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 they want to invest in steel. So economic risk is, is the risk that prices might fluctuate. The prices for steel might go up, might go down. Okay. So that is what? Economic risk. Then the political risk is that they've got to fulfill those promises and they risk that maybe the electorate might not... Um, might see that they have, they have not fulfilled those promises and might rise against them and so on and they might lose the next election because they have not fulfilled those promises. So you've got to apply your answer to the scenario. Don't just write if there's a scenario, apply your answer to the scenario. Okay. Then that is so that is the risk. So the risk there we said physical risks. That is maybe risk of fire, isn't it? And so on. Economic risks. And then financial risk. Because if the gap, if they if they are borrowing money, if they are going to borrow money, there is the risk that they might not what? Pay back the money. So there is a risk of a financial risk of what? The possibility of non-payment. Failure to what? Or of defaulting the, the loan. Okay. Is a risk that they might default because the assumption in investment appraisal is that or in financial management, because this is public sector financial management, the assumption is that when investing, the, the, the companies or organization usually they do not have finances readily available. The finances are usually obtained either from equity, meaning issue of shares, or they are obtained from borrowing. So you might, you might safely say in this scenario that the, one of the risks is what? The risk of um, default or financial risk that they might not be able to, 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 to meet their loan obligation, their loan interest obligation, and so on. Okay, so those are the, then explain the nature of performance Management. So now remember, part A is saying discuss. So you look at the pros and cons. When a question says discuss, it means they expect you to, to say more than just the risks. Okay? So you need to say more than just what? The risks. Because it's a discussion. Okay? It's a discussion. Then part B, explain the nature of performance management and describe five elements of performance management system cycle. So that one is straightforward. All you need is to, to, to explain, to define the performance management. And the elements, you know, the elements of performance managing, management system cycle. Okay. So that is, um, so you say it is a, a performance management is a concept in the field of human resource management. It's a continuous process of identifying, measuring, and developing the performance of individuals. So you explain, and then you start now, the five elements of performance management system. Number one, setting objectives. Number two, measuring the performance. Feedback, meaning a response, okay, and so on. The reward system, based on performance output. So you list those what? The, 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 the elements of what? Performance management. Okay, so those are the, the practical situations. So now, I would also like to advise you that the, this course 
is a, it's a professional course. It is not, you know, no, as, a, as a professional course, it's not just about academic where you just study and reproduce the information. You've got to apply. That's why they are scenario-based questions. And the only way you will know how to apply is by going through the past papers. Go through your past papers. Go to the Zika website. Download the past papers if you can. And read, you know, read through. Look at the past examination questions. Read through. See how the, the, the suggested solution is. I'm not saying that you should, you know, you should memorize the suggested solution, but in your own way, by reading the suggested solution, in your own way, you'll be able to tell how you'll be able to answer if that question came, you know, if, 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 if you came across that question, you know how you'll be able to respond to that question. Because you have an example from where? From the past papers. So it's very, very important that you go through all the past papers, as many as you can, because it is a practical exam. It is not academic, where you reproduce and you cite cases, no. This one will be given scenarios, and the way you apply them is based on your practice of what? Past papers, the way you've been practicing, the way you've been going through past papers. That is, that's what will help you on how you will be able to apply the knowledge because it means you've already gone, you, you, you have a similar scenario. Even in the exam, the scenarios are not very different from what you, what you saw in the past paper. They are very similar. So the chances of passing for someone who has gone through past papers are 70-80% compared to someone who has just read it. You know, notes because it's a past paper which guides you as to the, um, the type of questions and the level of knowledge and application that is required of you at this stage. Okay, so it's very, very important that, that you go through a past paper and buy the revision kit. Zika has got revision kits which has got questions and uh, you know, suggested solutions. So buy the revision kits. Go through those uh, revision kits and you shouldn't have a, a problem in uh, passing the exam. But once you ignore those, then the chances of failing become very high. Okay, so I'd like to thank you for your time, your attention. And if you have uh, further uh, questions, you can always contact Zika. For further questions, Zika will be able to help you. Thank you very much.